Hi everyone, and welcome back. So as I try, try to kind of finish up my main history series, um, we're down to British Imperial History in South Africa, um, Andrew Jackson, which I promise is coming, it's just going to take a bit, and the Guatemalan Revolution, a.k.a. the Ten Years of Spring. So, the Ten Years of Spring one is going to be a historiography video, and also a multiple perspective video, um, which is just a fun way to say it's going to be long, and it's going to take time to do. So, I thought... Today we might tackle in our kind of pattern lately where we are talking about rather tough and hard subjects like Reconstruction, our, the evolution of thought on the American Constitution, the legacy of Britain in India, Today might be the best day, especially with it being Black History Month in the United States, to tackle what kind of happened in British South Africa and what is the legacy of British South Africa. So, let's begin. Following the collapse of the First British Empire, we see a shift in policies for the British. Part of it was the British needed a new revenue stream and areas to expand their influence. While expansion into Africa and Asia wise was already established, the mindset of furthering expansion influence was starting to form. The issue was by this period, no real knowledge of the people in Africa or geography was well known as knowledge, some of the reliable, others not so, would influence policy as expansion, especially in South Africa, was underway. As imperial racial views were developing and the humanitarian sentiments were dying, the British in South Africa was slowly formalizing their imperiled hold. Missionaries would be some of the first people to make contact with groups like the Xosha people, but as they were slowly realizing that Xosha would not give up their culture, so British policies would reflect an expansionist and subjugation change in policy. By the time the Cape Colony was fully established, the questions of resource extraction and centralization of the colony became the new plan. While centralization of control of South Africa would run up against the Boers and create competition for leading power of South Africa, after two wars the British would become the leaders, but the Boers and the British would cause the racial tension and in issues in Africa South Africa, that lasts to this day. With that little introduction out of the way, let's get to the rest of this not so in small rant. After the fall of the 13 colonies, not a lot was known about Africa beyond North Africa and the west coast of Africa, and what was needed to be known about the slave trade. Most knowledge on South Africa came from Arabic. Most knowledge on Africa came from Arabic sources, and many of them were outdated or not translated or both. Which led to the issue of if Africa was going to be the next part of the empire. What does that mean, and how do we implement it? Alongside this, there were issues over slavery and the attempts at ending it, which led to the Mansfield decision, which, if you remember, um, 
if you remember my American Constitution historiography on uh, the slave constitution, you'll remember uh, how much the Mansfield decision kind of underpins that book. The, the Mansfield decision of no slavery in the Isles itself, but the empire kept it and the trade, which led to efforts to try and end it despite the issues of how much imperial revenue especially in, during, and post-Napoleonic Wars, really did underpin the imperial revenue stream alongside the tea, the tea trade. While the sugar plantations were a major source of revenue for the British, and so was the slave trade, the issue of morality of slavery and efforts by the humanitarians would continuously try and push for the end of the slave trade and eventually slavery. Unfortunately, how far these humanitarian efforts would go would also be shaped by experience and knowledge of Africa. The reality is, because of this lack of information, it would for a it would cause a lot of bad information and early assumptions to be made, especially as Enlightenment philosophy and science try to imagine a hierarchy. This led to the idea of the European, especially the British, on top, while Africans, they were viewed on the lowest end. Even religious views were racist, in saying these fallen people can be redeemed. Even humanitarians who thought of Africans as in have spiritual equality slowly start seeing them as lesser, especially as attempts at colonizing modern-day Sierra Leone fell apart. While all this was happening, the French colonial system was falling apart, on Santa Domingo, a.k.a. Haiti, where the Haitian slave revolt succeeded in gaining freedom and independence, and Britain was able to enforce an anti-slave trade blockade that would see to the slow end of the European, Brazilian, and United States slave trade in Africa. Domestic different story. That would see Granted, it would t take time, which saw a near permanent na British naval patrol for decades. But as we saw with the plantation, the idea of trying to build plantations in West Africa, the mindset of utilizing Africans for labor and whether they're in a position to have a voice in the running of government would play a major part in British imperial policy in Africa. Especially with the question of their policy on raw material harvesting, investment, or plantation, a policy of direct or indirect rule and religion. A lot of these issues were often decided by reports and occasionally Explorers using an Enlightenment mindset who had neither the knowledge or background to really give effective reports, but fed readers what they wanted to hear. What this oftentimes leaves us is the image that, that the image of Africa was an inconsistent, but oftentimes biased one where many narratives could be made, but often times seen through a lens meant to drive a purpose. While the humanitarians and missionaries were able to help end slavery in the British Empire and see it to the, the blockade on the slave trade was in, in force and interest in exploration and setting up positions in the interior of Africa were in at least getting established. The early hurdles, such as the fact that until bare medicine was in place, trying to traverse 
or exp explore beyond the coast often meant dying of disease, which made colonial ventures of even setting up penal colonies in Africa incredibly hard. While exploration on the Niger was done, not even occasional travels from Tripoli were done, but these were sometimes unsuitable. On top of that, you, when explorers did make it further, the amount of miscommunication and presumptions on Arab dominance led to disregard of nuance of African history and culture, which would shape colonial efforts and images even further to disregard cultures. Humanitarians, those who were willing to try and defend the de idea of African culture, eventually gave up, especially after the Sierra Leone colonial failure. This can be seen especially with the views of noble savages and barbarian narratives used. Unfortunately, the end of the humanitarian mindset would have consequence in areas like South Africa, as these efforts fell apart, a very negative and racist mindset would form against people like the Dzogsha. By the time we reach Britain's serious efforts to colonize South Africa, this racist outlook starts shaping a lot of views of Africa, and the missionaries were less willing to defend African culture and while not always aware of how they affect colonial ventures, the lack of humanitarian feelings, which does a major shift in the early period of South African colonialism, this is best shown in the shift of views of the missionaries. So the missionary attitudes towards the, the Zoksha was one that started out with initial humanitarian understanding that these people are descended from Adam, and while not understanding their culture outside from a materialistic view, they believe with the right missionaries they would be able to spread the gospel, and that with the second coming and the rise of the awakenings, all would be revealed to the people. The reality was the Zosha were aware of the missionaries and Christianity, in some cases, a slow synchronization of beliefs was happening, or conversions were happening, but they were happening through the view of Zosha culture. While a Church of Africa would come to be, it would happen, it wasn't happening in the way that missionaries would expect or want. Concerning all the mistrust of the Zosha, Chiefs and misunderstanding the position of the structure of the chiefdoms and culture caused issues. The Zosha chiefs' power came from their followers, so the reality was despite whatever personal feelings a chief or region may have, they still had to bow to their people and follow traditions. Alongside this, the intelligence, political skills, and rhetorics of chiefs could usually outsmart missionaries or use them as pawns in their rivalries. A lot of these missionaries were either not well educated or they didn't have the cultural knowledge of the Zosha, so their ability to utilize rhetoric or understand the war's traditions, movements, or ceremonies like the like coming of age. handicap things for, handicap their efforts. Because of this frustration of racist language and attitude would develop alongside the view that the Zosha Africans were liars and deceitful. Because the missionaries were now recognizing the need for state operations to help them break the power of the chiefs, and, in their point of view, brings civilization to the Zosha before they could spread the gospel to them. 
many were asking for state assistance, especially with the development of schools. Which brings us to the question of disconnect of the missionaries, who were the sources of information to the colonial officials, but they didn't understand that they were playing a role in colonization, or the fact that they were making the, their, the information for the foundation for future colonial assignments. Information from missionaries would shape a lot of colonial efforts, and because of the bias and mister, misunderstanding of culture and structure of Dzogsha chiefdoms, we see a lot of blame and wars with the Dzogsha. Dzogsha relations with the stake can best be described as tenuous and one that had to be developed over time. For much of the period, the British were working with an informal empire that, while had the tenets of liberalism, but still was working out the paradox paradoxes to establish an empire. For much of the early period, the Zosho were fighting frontier wars with the Dutch and Lair British, and even when the Zosha were losing territory to the British, the ability of the imperial state to capitalize or actually hold it was tenuous, which led to the Zosha forming a connection to the British that was ceremonial but not very politically dominated by the imperial state. While the state would try to enforce laws and create zones of direct rule, of influence, and establish ceremonial ceremonies designed to reinforce power, the truth is the power to do so was waning and failing and required cooperation of the chiefs and Zosha people, which the state just didn't have. Because the imperial state wasn't working with much more information of culture or politics of the Zosha, their ability to see beyond their uh, paternalistic light of what they were trying to establish was limited. But as the Cattle War, the War of the Axe, and the 1850 to 1853 showed that they were facing a grueling guerrilla war that required a scorch earth policy, but truly defeating the chiefs was still beyond them and they required justification. This was done through the use of magistrates and cattle killing and use of rivalries. By creating lies and paradoxes of despotism ignoring the rather democratic traditions of the chiefdoms, they were able to justify remo removal by arguing that the Zosha chiefs were preventing the spread of civilization to their people. Eventually, the chiefs would be removed from their power bases by the state and forced to move to plots of land where they weren't allowed to lead their peoples. Alongside this, by utilizing imperial laws in cases against the chiefs and eroding support of the chiefs, the British could move in. This isn't to say there won't be any more Zosha wars, because there would be continued resistance by the Zosha, especially on the frontier up into the tensions between the British and the Boers. Now... We're going to enter into the Anglo Boer Wars, which, if any of you have seen or watched anything on other history channel, history YouTube channels, you will probably understand the more military history side of it, but the political diplomatic history of it is even more messy somehow. The Anglo-Boer conflicts can be seen in four different lights. One is the pursuit of the empire, 
with the British trying to secure its South African holdings and pursuing imperial policies while, while also dealing with figures like Gladstone and others who weren't really of the imperial mindsets, but also might go through the motions of it. The second is resources, such as land for railroads and farms and mineral resources like gold, diamonds, and ports, and the acquisition of labor, which unfortunately did involve a guilty till proven innocent policy of using prison labor, which still echoes to this day in Africa, especially South Africa. Also, it was, it's interesting to also kind of see that a lot of this part of South African history really does get wrapped up in the creation of the De Beers Diamond Company, since we still hear a lot about them to this day. The third is colonial influences, which... Colony, Cape Ran by Rhodes, or the Boer slash Orange Free States, that basically who was going to lead? Was it going to be the Cape Colony or the Boer Orange Free States? The final one is the pursuit of union or federation and making this state of South Africa. One does see the tension of the discovery of gold and diamonds did fuel the want of snatching up lands and right to trade. But we also see argument of jurisdiction, colonial holdings, and dominance. Because the Boers, and to some extent the British, were trying to claim more land and territory and fear the natives um, see. Think of the Zosha Wars and probably one of the most famous points in South African history, the Anglo-Zulu Wars, but there were also wars with other groups that were also messy. In the end, part of the issue were that we still do see to some extent, is the view of a hierarchy in which the Boers and natives aren't really placed highly in the views of the British. Part of the reason the first Anglo-Boer War ended in disaster is that the British viewed the Boer leaders as ignorant and they could easily win, and this underestimating of enemies was also kind of the cause of the poor and poor initial endings in the Z Zulu War for the British. By this time, the humanitarian drive was gone, but pushing anti-slavery policy was a point that the Boers just didn't appreciate because the issue of labor, we see ideologies conflict, although as established by the Glenn Gray Act and issues of enfranchisement that we that would be issues for both the Anglo and the Boers. From immigrants to native Africans, we see hints of apartheid, especially in the early formation of the Cape of the Federation of South Africa. While both sides would team up to fight the Zulus, especially after the disaster of the first expedition, tensions would grow. The British Cape Colony would annex the Boer states only to isolate them and waste the few resources they had and cause a war. While the first Anglo-Boer War was fueled by resources and imperialism, it was thwarted through hubris and pride in thinking the Boer and the commandos couldn't win, and instead it was a slaughter. 
uh, one of the one of the politicians that would rise in this period would be Kruger, who would emerge following a tide of Boer nationalism and the formation of an Afrikaans language, alongside with expansion to Swaziland and some former Zulu lands. Their growth would be helped by the rich resources they had, but also face corruption and Kruger would face issues of immigration, trade, and corruption. Um, the, on, the, uh, on the British side, you see Rhodes, who was Kruger's counterpart, would try to bring back imperialistic feelings and try to raise the fortune of the Cape Colony, but face issues of parliamentary expansion, natives, finances, and including his own parliament, also the British parliament. While Rhodes would form many companies and see to expansion and reform in the Cape Colony, the, Boer in, the Boers in Cyberish holdings and his own issues of enfranchisement and building railroads and expanding north would see issues. Rhodes' expansions against natives and trying in many ways to brace the Boers in expansion and centralizing control and power is a good way to describe the colonial policy and imperial mindset, especially as natives are losing territory and sovereignty to the colonies. While an ill-advised uprising and telegrams and raids emerge caused by roads and Cougar dominating elections, the issues of enfranchisement and influence in South Africa came to a head in the Second Boer War. Again, we get bogged down by guerrilla warfare, but this time a scorch earth policy and capture of Boer officials saw victory. The resistance caused a drawn out conflict that saw the Boer surrenders but with lighter terms. With this, we see the eventual South African Union, but issues of influence, natives, enfranchisement, and land would continue to plague it, with some of these issues coming down to us today. In the end, the British mindset in South Africa reflects the mindset of British opinions of Africa and the growing view of a hierarchy that would describe colonialism and imperialism in general. While humanitarian efforts would end slavery and form some of the early missionary thinkings, by the time we get to a more formal empire, this mindset was on the way out, even if it would continue to try and end slavery in general. In the end, what we have left is a colonial government that was racing to become the leading power in South Africa and access to resources. Issues of enfranchisement, racism, and legacy of colonialism and missionary work are still part of an ongoing history in South Africa. I hope you enjoyed this video, and thanks for listening.